list. Um, well, here we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, Nis Jantaniku Omakes, the Wakaki, no Pachtu, Tu, Sitsikitita Pichakum. Hello, my name is Walking Raven Woman. Um, my government name is Mariah Gladstone. Um, and I'm coming to you guys from beautiful Bab, Montana, the town of 75% bees. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you guys about native plants, specifically. Um, native plants of Montana that indigenous people have traditionally used for tea. Um, my uh, PowerPoint definitely highlights that this is an incomplete list of tea plants, but it definitely is a place for us to get started talking about some of these phenomenal plants that we have in the state and that we can find wherever you're coming from. So, um, also, for some reason, my Zoom thinks that my virtual background is part of my earrings and keeps trying to make them invisible. So I'm just going to turn that off real fast because it's it's getting confusing. Um, give me one second. We'll just we'll just end that nonsense. Um, but uh, when I'm not doing talks about tea plants, um, my full-time job is running my business in Digi Kitchen, which is a combination of indigenous, digital, and kitchen. Um, and it's an online teaching tool, I guess in person as well, um, but primarily used for uh, re-learning and reteaching information about traditional indigenous foods and ways to make them in our modern kitchens. So um, I'll drop my contact information at the end in case you guys get bored and want to check out recipes for using um, indigenous foods or foods from your garden or wild game or other things like that. For now, we're going to dive into talking about plants. I will also mention that I realized that I am missing my circle of plant friends meeting for this, um, which is just funny that I have multiple botany things happening this evening. Um, but normally every full moon, we have a gathering on Zoom of indigenous plant academics um, from across Turtle Island. So we have everyone from folks in British Columbia to New York State, and we get together, we get to talk about plants um, on full moons because we're, we're fun and witchy like that. So, um, but this is, this is a fun way of celebrating plants as well. Um, so, I'm starting off real basic. Um, you guys know the field mint that we have in Montana, most likely because it grows so plentifully in wet areas. Um, up here on the Blackfeet Nation, we have a ton of field mint that is still very, very commonly harvested by people. Um, most folks in the state that are familiar with plants or hike at all in mountain areas or even um, along wet stream areas um, on the plains have probably come across mint. Um, I was walking alongside St. Mary Lake and of course I feel like I smell mint before I see it. So I started looking around once I smelled like I was standing in mint and then I could find it. Um, and mint obviously is easily identifiable by both its strong pepperminty smell as well as its square stem. So peppermint is easy to harvest. And I love peppermint because it is also something that enjoys being harvested as well. Um, cutting peppermint, harvesting it um, encourages the plant to to reproduce more. So, um, you know, if you've grown any type of mentha variety in your garden at home, that mint has a habit of taking things over. So we love mint for that reason. And of course, peppermint tea is something you're probably also familiar with. So it's very easy to make delicious, strong tea. Um, I'll go through at the very end, kind of some harvesting basics for the way that I generally harvest um, and dry my tea plants and then how I brew them. So it'll kind of be across the board, but if you do have any individual questions, throw them in the chat um, and then we'll have question time at the end where we can open it up for folks to unmute. I think there's enough folks that it would probably make it a little bit chaotic if people started unmuting. So we'll continue. Um, I will mention that peppermint is also something that has been used by a lot of uh, people 
traditionally as a seasoning, but also obviously as a medicine. So peppermint when mixed with tallow, like an animal fat, um, think lard or bison tallow is traditionally what it was mixed with, can be rubbed on the chest and it's a great respiratory medicine. So Vicks Vapor Rub was originally peppermint and tallow. Just so you know, Vicks completely stole the mentha fat idea from the Blackfeet. And that's what I'm gonna stand by. Um, so this is another plant that has a million different common names, horse mint, bee balm, wild bergamot, monarda. Um, Blackfeet people call it managapi. Um, but this is our, our horse mint. Um, and if you're familiar with this, it is an amazing tea. It's a really, really good medicinal tea. And actually I have some of it that's falling apart in this bowl here. But it's harvested generally when the flowers bloom. And I think that besides making a great tea, the flowers themselves, the dried flowers, you can kind of let dissolve in your mouth. And it has like an almost chloroseptic effect on your throat. So it's super great if you start coming down with a sore throat. It's a wonderful uh, medicine for immunity, for all of that. Um, I also use the leaves as a seasoning. They have a flavor that's very, very similar to oregano. So I'll mix them in pizza sauces or in uh, or crusts or any type of thing where you would use oregano. Um, and a lot of people grow this plant in their gardens as well. Um, obviously it's a wonderful native plant, but it also is a great food for pollinators. So it is something that's really easy to help nourish our local bees and other pollinators. And it's just a really, really pretty plant. It comes in a lot of colors, but this is what our native variety looks like here. Um, again, you can use it for tea, seasoning, medicine. Um, and I know the Lakota have also traditionally used this plant as love medicine. I don't know the specifics of that, but it is, it is one of its uses. I just don't know how. Um, yarrow, this is one of my favorite plants. Um, so yarrow is obviously a plant that most people are familiar with because it grows everywhere. Um, yarrow in Montana, mostly um, our native varieties are white. Um, sometimes they're a light, light pink. So I have some light pink yarrow that grows near my house up on the reservation here on the Rocky Mountain front. Um, but there is also some varieties of yarrow that are non-native. There are some cultivated varieties of yarrow that you can buy at garden stores and stuff. And they'll come in oranges and yellows and reds, and vibrant pinks and things like that. So our native variety looks like this. And it is another plant that has a number of different uses. It's a great immune boosting tea. I love it for that reason. But also that scientific name, Achille, Achillea millifolium, comes from stories that say that Achilles, the, the Greek warrior, used to take Yarrow with him into battle. Um, we know that Achilles was basically invincible, save for that little heel issue. Um, but Yarrow has amazing blood clotting properties. So Blackfeet warriors used to take Yarrow with them into battle as well. It's because the leaves, whether they're fresh or dried, can act as a phenomenal blood clotting agent. Um, you just chew them up real briefly and then put them on whatever injury you have. So yarrow has been used to treat arrow wounds, bullet wounds, knife wounds, uh, childbirth, prevent hemorrhaging. Um, it's an amazing plant to have. Um, and if you are not hiking somewhere with yarrow, you should definitely have some dried yarrow in your first aid kit, in your pack, uh, because it really does have a wonderful ability to treat um, injuries that won't stop bleeding. So super important field medicine knowledge, but also a really, really wonderful tea. Um, I had some tea the other day when I was out hunting that was yarrow, 
and raspberry leaf tea. And it was super delicious, really, really refreshing. Um, and it was just made from two things that were growing in my front yard. So um, easy way of making a nice tea. And yarrow has a flavor profile. Um, at least the leaves have a flavor profile similar to tarragon. So you can use it as a seasoning as well. I use dried yarrow in soups. I made yarrow aioli the other day from scratch by mixing a little bit of um, and some garlic and then I mixed some yarrow into some oil and eggs, right? And made my own basically fancy mayonnaise, but yarrow is great for seasoning that. So uh, raspberry. So obviously in Montana, our native variety of raspberry, um, same genus and species as uh, the cultivated variety. They're just different subspecies. So I love our little raspberries in Montana, but of course they're not specifically bred to produce tons and tons of gigantic raspberries like the cultivated varieties are. Um, the ones in my front yard will only produce raspberries every two years, which is pretty typical of raspberries, but in the years that they're not producing, um, I can still harvest leaves and get wonderful raspberry leaves off of them. So um, raspberry leaves are a great women's medicine. Um, I know that a lot of doulas will have pregnant women drinking raspberry leaf tea. Yeah, um, it's it's a lovely tea. It's also kind of has like a anti bloating properties. So um, raspberry leaf tea is safe for anyone to drink, and it. I think if you look up raspberry leaf tea online it generally comes up as like a whole bunch of like weight loss tea. <laughs> uh, and it's simply because it kind of has an anti-bloating property. So uh, it, the immediate effect is that you drop some of that water weight that you're holding on to, which I guess if you don't know what's happening, it feels like weight loss. Um, but really it's just, it's just a lovely, slightly sweet flavored tea anyway. Um, so I like mixing it with yarrow because that has a slightly more bitter flavor. Um, and it's just delicious. So um, my raspberries also grow plentifully and everything in that rubus genus freaking loves disturbance. So when I moved into my house, the whole front yard, it was like a vacation home with people that didn't really watch their yard because they weren't here that often. And so the entire yard was overgrown. And so just to get rid of like all these like brambles and things that were growing in the front yard, it looked like the castle outside of like where Sleeping Beauty was imprisoned. Um, and so I took one of those propane flamethrowers and set fire to whatever chaos was there. And then at the end, I was like, oh no, this was a raspberry patch <laughs> that I just burned up. Um, but raspberries chill like that. It likes things like fire. And so uh, obviously it didn't give me any raspberries the first year, but produces raspberries after that um, and it's very happy now and honestly it got rid of a lot of the chaos so if you walk around in old burn areas you will likely see a lot of raspberries or of course another one of our favorite rubus species um, thimbleberries so also fun fact there are no poisonous compound berries in North America so if you ever are hiking around somewhere on this continent and you see a lovely compound berry like a thimble berry or a blackberry or a raspberry or something that has that compound berry look um it's it's edible and safe and probably delicious because salmon berries cloud berries they're all in that delicious category of berries um not only will it not kill you but it will be amazing <laughs> um unlike certain things that won't kill you but taste gross snowberries um plantains so plantains are not a native species in that they were not here prior to colonization however plantains are kind of an adopted species that um almost everyone's familiar with because they Weird. grow so plentifully um yep, oh, I... someone's unmuted mute no hello human okay i think I think you're gone now or you're muted now. I don't know who you were. Um, so plantains are great. Um, besides being a tea plant, they're they're very generic, kind of um, 
like a grassy flavored tea. They don't have much of a flavor, but they have great immune boosting properties. Um, but plantain itself is something that I like using one because you can harvest as much plantain as you want, and you're not gonna you're not gonna endanger plantain, right? <laughs> um, but it's really great um, for treating bee stings. If you get stung by a bee, um, chew up some of that plantain leaf. You can put it on there. Um, I know people that have used plantain to make salves for treating burns. Um, seen really incredible burn healing from salves made with plantain leaves. Um, and it's just, it's edible, you know, you can make a salad with plantain, you can do lots of things with it. And almost all of us have it growing in our yards or somewhere. Um, I found the only place on the trail to Firebrand Pass that happened to have plantain growing randomly in the middle of the trail. Um, and it was at exactly that moment that someone on the hike I was leading got stung by a bee. So we got to put our plantain use to, to use. Um, we didn't know if she was allergic, actually. She'd never been stung by a bee before. So we put some plantain on, on the bee sting and she got down the hill okay. So I'm assuming she's not allergic or the plantain is magical. Both are likely. Um, anyway, plantain, good thing to know. Rose hips, we love our wild roses in Montana. Um, for folks that were paying attention to our berry yields last year, um, which is probably everyone in this group, you'll you'll know that we didn't have a lot of berries, like huckleberries, service berries, uh, thimbleberries, everything was just not producing a lot of berries. And so um, the only thing that I noticed in great numbers was rose hips. Um, rose hips are definitely something that Blackfeet people kind of thought of as an emergency food, not because they're not delicious. They're, they're lovely and they're slightly sweet, um, but they have these seeds in them, which kind of make you itchy if you ate the seeds. They're not poisonous, but Blackfeet would call them itchy oozy berries. And that's just referring to how they make your entire digestive system itchy um, in a not great way. So I felt bad when I saw all the bear scat just full of rose hip seeds. Um, but I will mention that rose hips are remarkably high in vitamin C. So if you're gonna process these for tea, um, you cut them open and I just take like a little paring knife. I'll just grab a ton of rose hips at one time, take a paring knife and like a little spoon and just scoop those seeds right out of them. Um, you can discard the seeds. You can make rose hip seed oil, um, which is lovely for like treating your skin. You can make a, like an infused argan oil with rose hip seeds. Um, and that is, I don't know, it's what the Royals swear by or something, but it makes you look young forever, supposedly. Uh, <laughs> or you can just use rose hips themselves after the seeds have been removed. Whatever you'd like to use. You can also um, dry the roses themselves, those lovely wild roses. You can dry those and you can add those petals to a tea. Um, but again, super high in vitamin C. I hope none of you ever get scurvy because you have so many skills for fighting scurvy. Um, <laughs> rose hips, um, actually any conifer, so any needled tree you can make into lovely tea, except you. Do not use you, that is poisonous. Um, but one of my favorite conifer teas is cedar. Um, spruce makes a good tea. Douglas fir tea is really good. Um, subalpine fir, or what Blackfeet calls sweet pine, that makes a really good tea. Um, all of those are remarkably high in vitamin C. So. They're also something that you can harvest at any time out of the year. Similar rose hips stay on the branches even into the winter. So rose hips are one of the few things that you can still harvest this time of year as long as you can see them. Uh, they're also bright red, which makes them easy to find in the snow. Stinging nettle. Um, so stinging nettle is a plant that we definitely have growing around uh, Montana. Also has a ton of uses. Um, Stinging nettle is pretty much native to the whole Northern hemisphere. So I know that stinging nettle tea um, has been used 
in a lot of places for thousands of years. If you're in Scandinavia, um, stinging nettle tea is basically one of those cure-all treatments. You know, if you're feeling under the weather, it's have some nettle tea in a sauna, right? Um, so stinging nettle is of course a great tea for anything. I like nettle tea by itself. I think it's earthy, slightly sweet. Um, I also like cooking with nettle. So nettle is a great wild green, but of course it kind of stinks. So if you're going to cook with it, I recommend blanching it in like boiling water for a second first. And then you can use it just like spinach. And it tastes really similar to spinach, only uh, almost slightly sweeter. So you can add it to stir fries or omelets, um, other things like that. Anywhere you would use cooked spinach, stinging nettle makes a great substitute for. A um, Couple other uses of stinging nettle include the incredible ability to treat pain. And you're like, Mariah, why would I do that? It will sting me. Yes, it will. But if you make it sting you in excess, it'll actually overpower your nervous system. Um, so those stings will eventually, your nervous, your nerves will get tired and say, uh-uh, no more, and they'll turn off. So my friend, my friend was having a fibromyalgia flare up when we were at, um, a food sovereignty conference in Tama, Iowa. And Linda Black Elk, who is a wonderful botanist, she teaches at United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck. Um, she was there doing a presentation on plants. And so they had some native gardens out behind the, the casino that this conference was being hosted at. And we went outside and Linda was mentioning how stinging nettle can be used to treat pain. And so my friend went and talked to her and she gave her a stinging nettle piece, right? And so we went into the bathroom at this casino <laughs> and my friend pulled her shirt up so her back was exposed. She hadn't slept in like two days because the pain was so intense. And so I just brushed the stinging nettle over her back <laughs> just a few times and she's like, wow, it's burning. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, but after about 10 minutes of it burning, she actually went and curled up under a table that had a tablecloth over it and fell asleep right on the floor of the conference because her body finally was like, this is, I'm not in pain right now, um, which was kind of cool. So stinging nettle, great. Um, also seen it used as a pain treatment on someone with some herniated discs that was having back pain. So fun, fun facts, um, a little, a little intense, um, but is an interesting treatment method. Um, Stinging nettle, great immune boosting tea, I mentioned. Um, also, stinging nettle can be dried and then those stems can be stripped for fibers and you can use it to make your own twine. So if you know how to wrap cordage, stinging nettle breaks down into phenomenal fibers, kind of like hemp wood, and you can use it to make your own nets. Um, that's actually, I was at a different conference in Red Lake, Minnesota, um, on the Red Lake Nation, they were having their food sovereignty get together. And so there was different presenters and I was in some different sessions. And I noticed there was a guy in the back of a lot of these sessions that just had, he was just fiddling with something. At one point I'm like, what are you doing? You know, some people just listen better when they're playing with something in their hands. And that's what he was doing. The entire conference, he was spinning stinging nettle twine from this ball of fibers that he had into a little ball of rope. So it looked like a little hemp rope that he was making, but it was a nettle rope, a little twine, right? Um, and I was like, what are you doing? And so he showed me, showed me how to do it. And I was like, what is the goal with this? And he's like, I'm going to make my own gill net. <laughs> I don't know if this guy is planning on going on like alone at the TV show at some point, but he has the skills. So Nettle is a, a great plant to know for that reason. Um, all right, black elderberry. Are there any plants that look like mint that are not? Um, sorry, that was a question that popped up and I noticed it. Um, are there any plants that look like mint that are not? Um, mint has a pretty distinctive mint smell. Um, other folks might have some thoughts on lookalikes, but that square stem is pretty much a dead giveaway for mint plants. Um, and then there's a ton of different variety of mints, but if you are in the wild and something smells like mint and has a square stem, it's, it's pretty
pretty much mint. Um, unless, unless somebody has, unless somebody has something that I'm not thinking of, but. Um, black elderberry is one of many varieties of elderberry that we have in Montana. We also have um, some blue elderberry, some uh, dwarf elderberry, just some different varieties of elderberry, um, but they all look pretty similar to this in that they will grow in that same way. Um, the elderberries themselves are relatively small. They are probably about the size of, I'm just gonna say, what's a good comparison for me to use? Uh, about the size of like a, like a pencil eraser when they're ripe. And then when you dry them, they will obviously shrink in size. So elderberries are something that has a pretty narrow window of harvest time because you wanna harvest them after they turn lovely and purple and dark um, or black, blue, whatever the variety of elderberry is that you're looking for. You want them to be ripe, but also the birds will try to get them almost immediately. Um, elderberry is also interesting because it's not a berry that we eat raw. Um, that's because the seeds have cyanide in them, similar to apple seeds, but obviously elderberries are much tinier and harder to avoid the seeds. So the best way to work with elderberries, I generally think is to dry them for preservation. That drying process generally neutralizes most of the cyanide, if not all, um, but then I rehydrate them in boiling water. And that boiling water will rehydrate the rest or will, will destroy the rest of the, or if any remaining cyanide is present. Um, and then you can juice them, um, which is generally what I do. I will rehydrate them for, by simmering them for 30 minutes in hot water. Um, and then I will pour that water and those berries through a cheesecloth and just squeeze the heck out of them to get all of that good elderberry juice out of there. Um, but you can simply put some of those dried elderberries directly into your tea blend. Uh, I like the flavor of elderberries. I think it's really lovely. So I like adding it to tea blends for a good sweet flavor. Um, it's not super strong when you make it into a tea. So if you're making it with mint, the mint will likely overpower the elderberry flavor. But another thing I've done with elderberries is taken that elderberry juice after they're rehydrated and literally mixed it with tomato paste and apple cider vinegar and chili powder and made barbecue sauce because you can make elderberry barbecue sauce. <laughs> um, or you can mix it with honey um, and cinnamon and cloves and make your own um, elderberry syrup. You can mix it with a gelatin or an agar agar and make your own elderberry gummies whatever. Um, elderberry itself has some really cool research. There's a lot of peer-reviewed articles at this point that talk about its efficacy at fighting the flu virus. So um, elderberry is a useful plant to have in your flu season arsenal. Um, even if you're making delicious, delicious um, like barbecue pork sandwiches with elderberry barbecue sauce, totally totally legit, we'll fight the flu, um, or shredded bison sandwiches, even better. Um, I have a recipe for elderberry uh, barbecue sauce on my website, by the way, so I'm not just making things up. Um, what do you mix for barbecue sauce again? Um, I will make sure I link my website and then you can, you can pull it. Most barbecue sauces are tomato based. So you can use like tomato sauce or tomato paste, and then some type of vinegar to add that tang. I've used maple vinegar. I've used apple cider vinegar. Both are kind of sweet vinegars. Um, and then you can add spiciness, whether it's cayenne pepper or chili powder or um, chili flakes or smoked chipotle seasoning, whatever. Um, something that's going to add a little bit of heat. And then you can kind of adjust that and play with making your own barbecue sauces. Okay. Now, broken. Okay. Mullen. You guys probably know mullen. Um, this is another one of those plants. This is technically. Um, let's see. Mullen is known. Um, mullen is a great respiratory tea. Um, some people think of mullen as like 
a great toilet paper plant, which is fair. Mullen makes a fine toilet paper um, <laughs> because it has these really fuzzy leaves. And almost everyone I know in the state has mullen growing somewhere near them, um, which is another reason I put it on this list because some folks that are like, we don't have any elderberry. We live in Montana City, <laughs> right? Someone here is from Montana City. I'm sure you have mullen though, <laughs> um, because mullen loves dry soils. I saw it growing all over like the hills by White Sulphur Springs and Townsend, but also right up here on the roads going into Glacier. Um, Mullen is a phenomenal plant for treating um, respiratory illnesses. So if you have a bad cough, um, if you have chest congestion in any way, mullen is awesome. And it's also, it grows so plentifully that um, it's also something that's really easy to harvest um, without concern for, for over harvesting. Also, it has these great big leaves. Like you can take a couple leaves off of a plant. You know how much tea you will end up with from like four mullen leaves. It's a lot of tea. Um, so that's also a great reason to use it. I will say mullen is a plant that loves growing in ditches and near roadways. Um, and so I always try to make sure that I'm not harvesting from immediately by roadways, simply because if I'm making tea, I don't want something that's going to be covered in exhaust fumes and roadside dirt. Someone's not needed. I think we're fine now. We were having a bad echoey moment. Um, so I will say that that's part of harvesting. Mullen, especially plantains, similarly, um, if you're harvesting from, you know, plantain, because it's not a native plant, it's almost always growing somewhere there's been disturbance. And because it grows in people's yards a lot of the time, you wanna make sure that they haven't sprayed for pesticides right? You want to make sure that you're not putting things like that into your body. Um, if you're wild harvesting in national forests or national parks or something like that, um, obviously if you're harvesting for consumption, totally allowed in national parks, um, if that's relevant, if you're near Yellowstone or Glacier. Um, but also, you know, then you don't have to worry about things being sprayed as much unless you're harvesting mullen directly by the roadside and they've been spraying for knapweed and other things of that sort. Just be aware of where you're harvesting. For example, I will go and harvest juniper from like college campuses when I'm on college campuses to make tea to serve at demos, right? But also they're college campuses. Sometimes drunk kids are walking home at the middle of the night. So we always harvest above waist level. These are just the things that we do. We're thinking smart, right? <laughs> uh, but just things to think about. Um, I'm going to go over some harvesting basics, kind of the ways that I think about harvesting for tea plants, um, and also recommend that you guys check out um, my, my graduate advisor's short essay, which is The Honorable Harvest. I'll find a link to it, and I'll drop it in the chat in a second. Um, which kind of just details some indigenous principles for harvesting to prevent over harvesting um, and also to make sure that you're honoring the plants that are giving you wonderful gifts like delicious tea and medicines and food. So I will almost always harvest in the mornings if I'm going out specifically for tea because I want the maximum flavor to be in the plant. Um, so I will harvest after the dew burns off in the morning, but before noon, just because, especially for a lot of these things that we're harvesting in the summer, um, the sun, the UV rays kind of cook out the flavonoids for the day um, by the time it reaches the hottest part of the day. So I try to harvest before noon. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule. If you're in a shady area, it's a little bit different, um, but for a lot of things, just makes things taste better. Um, and then you'll notice like I did with my yarrow here, I will tie up a bundle of it somehow. Uh, I just had a zip tie, so I put a zip tie around these. Um, but I've done it with pipe cleaners or strings or all manner of things. And then it's really easy for me to hang this. And I will hang my plants. So I'll rinse them off once I get inside. 
Um, I'll rinse them off and then I'll hang them in a dark place. It doesn't have to be totally dark, but I want it to be away from direct sunlight. Um, again, same principle. Um, you just don't want the flavor to be cooked out of things. It's the same reason you try not to store your herbs and um, any type of dried plants in direct sunlight. You want to make sure that you're protecting the flavor of that and the integrity of the medicines. Um, so I have a closet in my laundry room downstairs that gets enough airflow. It's nice and dry. Um, so things will dry out. I'm not, don't have to worry about them molding, but also I want to make sure that the plants are not reaching for the sun either. Um, plants want to live. And so if they're exposed to sunlight, they want to grow and it kind of inhibits the, the drying process. Um, when the plant is crispy, so I don't know if you can see this, but I want this plant to be totally falling apart to the touch. Um, it's falling apart to the touch to such an extent that it's getting on my computer, which is great. I'll have to vacuum it. Um, <laughs> but you want it to be super, super crispy. You want to be able to bend a branch and it, or a stem and it will just snap. Um, if there's any moisture left in the plant that you're trying to dry, it's not going to store well. It's going to mold. You're going to ruin your entire batch of plants that you've harvested. And that's going to mess up your day and feel like you have not honored the plant. So make sure that your plants are crispy. Um, there are a couple of plants that you could definitely not dry. So when I harvest cedar, so this is flat cedar, this is Western red cedar um, that I harvested on the side of the mountains. Um, if you're anywhere, shoot from Libby all the way to I don't know, West Glacier-ish area. Um, you can probably find some cedar somewhere um, if you know where to look. I found one place on the east side of the mountains where I found cedar too, but I'm keeping it my secret. Um, and you can just throw fresh cedar right into a pot of water on your stovetop and make tea. It's also lovely to be sweetened with maple syrup. Um, so not everything needs to be dried, but for storage, definitely helpful to dry things out. Um, the other thing I would say is I prefer storing my teas in glass if I can. So I will save like old pickle jars and old spaghetti sauce containers and things like that. And I'll store my plants in those. Um, but sometimes I harvest like a ton of raspberry leaves or something. And I know that there's a, actually there's a program um, with Fast Blackfeet, which is a local nonprofit um, on the Blackfeet reservation that will do a weigh-in pay station and they'll buy native plants to mix into tea blends for their food pantry participants so that the people that are getting food from the food pantry in Browning actually have options to get native traditional teas. And so they'll buy from local harvesters and local growers that grow peppermint and bee balm and yarrow and raspberry leaves, um, leaves, my bad. Um, and so that can do like a weigh and pay. Uh, and so if I don't have a big jar or I'm taking it into town to be sold, cause I know it's gonna be mixed into individual tea blends. Basically, if it won't be in the storage vessel for over a month, I'll store it in like a big like gallon or two gallon size Ziploc bag. That's fine for short periods of time, but I wouldn't say store it in there for a long period of time. Similarly, um, if I'm harvesting, I almost always bring like a big paper bag, like a big grocery bag or even a smaller grocery bag. Um, that said, I've been on the trail before and I've just found a whole bunch of elderberries and I needed them. Um, and so I have harvested elderberries and just put them in like a generic, plastic grocery bag that I had. Um, again, things are not necessarily hard and fast rules, except I always want to make sure that I'm giving back to the plants that are sharing their gifts. So um, for Indigenous people, a lot of the time what that means is 
we offer tobacco. Um, so I will generally hike with like a little tobacco pouch to lay some tobacco down. Um, that's not everyone's way of showing the plant's appreciation. So there are a couple of other ways that I recommend that people can also show their appreciation to plants and give back to them. Um, sometimes that is pulling some napweed that's around them. Um, and helping um, remove that competitor that's releasing the the what's what's that great word um so wonderful word that i can't remember for some reason right now um but it's the chemical that napweed releases into the soil which low-key poisons the soil and makes it toxic for some of the native plants so it helps to be able to pull those out um sometimes it's taking some of your water from your water bottle and giving the plants a little drink. And that's your way of saying thank you and giving back to it. And it's just recognizing that reciprocity. If you're taking something, you should give something as well. And then rather than just being a one-sided relationship, it becomes more an exchange of gifts. Um, again, let me look up. So this is my information. If you guys are looking for recipes or information later. That's how you can find me. I'm going to stop sharing right now. And honorable harvest. Okay, perfect. Robin pulled it and put it in the chat so that you can read um, honorable harvest, the lessons from an indigenous tradition of giving thanks. That's my wonderful graduate advisor. Um, any books on the Blackfeet uses use of herbs? That's a super good question. Um, let me, let me find, I can't remember the exact name of the book. So give me one second. I'm going to find it. If anyone else has any questions. Ooh, dried mullein leaves are used by some to quit smoking, like used as a smoking replacement. I'm assuming, Julia, that's what you're talking about. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Blackfeet people have also used kinikinik. The, that little like kind of ground cover plant that grows in alpine areas. We use that to flavor our tobacco for smoking. Um, and then also, um, also strawberry, wild strawberry leaves used in smoking blends as well have also been used to flavor smoking blends. Um, Mullen paste cures nettle itch. That's super interesting. I like that. Um, do plantain seeds help ward off mosquitoes, eat or rub on? I don't know about plantain seeds, but I will rub yarrow leaves on my skin to ward off mosquitoes. Those have that really fragrant scent. So I've used those. Um, there we go. You guys are so helpful with all of your knowledge. I'm going to go grab a book real fast because I need to figure out what the name of it is. Wilmer has gone. I would just encourage everyone to check out Indigi Kitchen. It's a really great project and there's a ton of content on the website. Um, so um, much more than she could cover in our time together today. So definitely make use of that. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys a book, but actually I'm also going to drop a link in the chat, and I know you nerds are going to love this um, <laughs> because it is one of my favorite resources, especially when I was in my graduate program. Um, the website itself is, it, it's a very basic website, so don't get too excited about the lack of design. Um, but this is Native American Medicinal Plants. Um, it is an ethnobotanical dictionary. So in this, you can look up plants or you can look up tribes. Um, and so, you know, you can look up different plants and find every single indigenous use that has been referenced in literature um, almost at any point. Um, so you can find, you know, if you look up Blackfeet, then you can, yeah, you can find every plant that Blackfeet people have traditionally used as um, anti-diarrheal uh, plants, um, as blood medicines, dietary aids, emetic, eye medicines, gastrointestinal aids. There's just, there's a lot, it's a lot. Um, 
This is Native American Medicinal Plants, edited by Daniel E. Mormon. M-O-E-R-M-A-N. But also, this is a big, chunky book. And sometimes, I mean, it's fun. Obviously, I have a physical copy of it. But I literally just gave you guys a website, which is the digitized version of everything in the book. So you can look up a plant and you can be like, hey, um, here's this lovely plant, yarrow. Uh, what, what have Native people traditionally used yarrow for? And you can look up either yarrow or Achillea millifolium. And then you can look up every single tribe and what they've tr traditionally used yarrow for. And it almost always has the academic references as well. So you can even go find the original reference, whether it was some journal from the 1800s that someone wrote down, um, whether it was whatever. Um, so it's super cool. It's a super cool resource to go digging through, but I just gave you guys the website. So you don't, you don't even need to go looking through the book, but I, I enjoy the book because um, I like a physical book. Um, so that would be something that I enjoyed as the Montana Field Guide. Include native context and uses. Not, not really, no. Um, actually, a lot of the times it's funny to look at field guides. Um, like I know that almost every field guide that talks about choke cherries will say, choke cherries are poisonous. Do not eat them, right? And it's okay, fair. They do have large pits and those pits do contain a fair amount of cyanide. Um, but Every native nation I know would traditionally eat the pits. Um, but we did it because we took the choke cherries and then we pounded them down with a rock, pits and all, and then we dried them into little patties, which means, hold on. Okay, choke cherries, dried into little patties. Those are pits. They're hard, but you chew on these slowly. You can go crunch, crunch, crunch and like worry about breaking a tooth or you can just kind of chew on it um, and it will kind of rehydrate in your mouth. It's like, it's like the most aggressive fruit leather you've ever had because all the moisture is gone from it. Um, but the pits, are, you remember the drying thing we talked about? That neutralizes the cyanide in the pits. And now there's cool peer reviewed research which talks about the way that Lakota people would rehydrate the pits, uh, would rehydrate those little patties to make choke cherry pudding. And traditional way uses the pits of the choke cherries as well. Um, but a lot of people when they work with choke cherries, they just juice them and they don't include the pits in their choke cherry sauces or jams or whatever, right? Fair, they're very hard. <laughs> um, but this woman, I think she was from Pine Ridge, but she went to college and then she um, had heard that choke cherry pudding is healing, specifically against cancer. And so she decided that she wanted to do a research project where she tested it. So she made choke cherry pudding the traditional way with the pits. And then she make choke cherry pudding kind of the more modern way, excluding the pits and just juicing the choke cherries and making the pudding that way. And then she took the pudding and she put the pudding on little petri dishes covered in ovarian cancer cells. And what was interesting is the choke cherry pudding made with the pits slowed and stopped the growth of the cancer cells. Whereas on the other petri dish, it didn't have any effect on them. So um, I can find that article um, about that because I thought that was super cool. So the things that are referenced in field guides as being poisonous, true, but is not the entire story. So uh, I think that's interesting that, yeah, let's, let's see. Um, so there's some stuff in here. This is from, 
I'll just link an Indian Country Today article. I think she was actually a high school student. And I'm sorry, it wasn't ovarian cancer cells, it was uterine cancer cells. Yep. Mariah, could you uh, talk a little bit more about Indigi Kitchen and what you're sure. doing with that project? Sure. So um, I get to have the incredibly fun job of teaching people to work with traditional indigenous foods or rather traditional indigenous ingredients. So anything that would have been found on the continent prior to 1492, I use to make recipes. Um, so that has a very broad definition, obviously, that includes all manner of native plants. Um, shoot, we have 14 different berries that are here on the Blackfeet Reservation alone, um, not to mention all of our wonderful wild game and fish and root vegetables. I'm super excited. I'm actually working with some high school students doing trail crew this summer to do a traditional camas bake. So you guys are probably familiar with camas. They have these big, um, I guess, big in terms of wild root vegetables, um, these big bulbs, but they're very high in inulin. And so we have to do this big pit roast to cook them so that they can be really digestible and it caramelizes all the sugars. Um, you can also cook camas in a slow cooker instead of a giant pit roast, but I have a crew that can babysit a fire for two days. So we're going to do it. Um, but I get to do fun things like that. But I make cooking videos um, and teaching tools. Um, sometimes they're cooking adjacent or food systems related. So sometimes that is more about traditional polyculture planting methods of different Native people. I'm, Blackfeet on my dad's side, but Cherokee on my mom's side. So I come from both a hunter-gatherer tradition as well as a farming and agricultural tradition. Um, and so I get to incorporate all of that knowledge into teaching people cool things. And then I work with it, of course, in the modern kitchen because I want more people to eat traditional native foods. I want folks to be able to incorporate that into their daily lives and not just as something for just special occasions. So. I will throw uh, an elk roast in an Instapot and <laughs> use that as my cooking method. Um, I love using ground bison and butternut squash to make lasagna because of course, bison, butternut squash and tomatoes are all indigenous foods. Season it with, you can season it with oregano or you can season it with bee balm um, and just get to work with a lot of fun things, get to work with wild onions, but also include substitutions that make sense for people that um, can find things a little bit easier at the grocery store. You know, if you can only find blueberries um, in the grocery store, that's an easy substitution for service berries or huckleberries if you're not someone that's able to go out and gather those things. Um, so I get to work with a lot of different things, but um, I'm also someone that experiments a lot with food. So as I mentioned, I make lasagna with uh, indigenous ingredients because of course they're, they're indigenous ingredients. Um, I've made pad thai using only native things. Um, peanuts, chilies are of course indigenous. And then I just substituted zucchini noodles instead of the rice noodles. Um, used maple vinegar um, instead of the rice vinegar to make the sauce. Um, just got to play with a lot of fun things like that. So I am really lucky that it is something that people are excited about. People tend to enjoy making the recipes, but it's also something that I've noticed brings people together. Cooking together as a family is something that folks are really passionate about about doing more of. Um, I get to see people in my Facebook comments on my business page tagging their grandparents or their aunts or whoever and saying, can we make this this weekend? Um, and then people will put up recipes from my site in their Instagram stories. And um, I get to see that. I get to see people commenting on YouTube videos. Someone I put up a recipe for a layered enchilada bake, which is actually something that I made. It was a recipe I developed because I was just using foods from the WIC ingredient list, the foods that you can buy if you're on WIC. And so I made a recipe and I put it on my website and 
I got a comment. Someone said, we made this this week and we ate the whole thing. <laughs> like, oh, that's awesome. Great. Uh, because it means that people are using the information. So that's what's most important to me. Um, I just try to make information really accessible. And that's in part because there's been so much really intentional work to disconnect Native people from our food system. But also because I think that non-Native people are also really interested in connecting more with local food systems, with eating less processed foods, and with finding that connection between what they're putting in their body and how they can give back to where their food's coming from, that, that idea of reciprocity. So that's more about what I do. Um, I get to do a lot of fun work. I've done some projects on grocery store distribution in the state of Montana. Um, I'm working on a children's cookbook. I am doing some videos and working with school lunch programs in the state of Montana to incorporate more native menu items and work with native producers to help supply some of the foods for school lunch programs in the state. So I get to do a ton of really, really fun things. Um, and then I get to I'm teaching a, like a desserts class with Atlas Obscura. Uh, it's like a four week class where we're just making indigenous desserts for four weeks. Um, so we get to do everything from, I think we're doing peanut butter cookies and pumpkin, dark chocolate pumpkin seed brownies. We're cooking with tallow and making pecan pie bars. It is all sweetened with maple syrup or agave or berries. Um, we get to make maple syrup and maple sugar, just different things in that vein. So. Um, I, I have a super fun job and I get to do things like this and just talk about teas. <laughs> That's great. That's, it's fun to hear just uh, the enthusiasm in your voice because uh, I can tell you're really passionate about this. Um, yeah, no, no one told me when I was taking high school career tests that this was a real job. So yeah. hey, I have an engineering degree I don't use too, but... Well, thank you so much for joining us today and thanks everyone for coming out and for uh, a great season of MNPS Presents. Uh, hopefully see a lot of you at the annual meeting and then um, maybe back in the fall for the next presentation. Um, so have a, have a great spring, everyone. And thanks again, Mariah. Thank you guys so much for having me. All right. Good night, everyone.